Hello everyone! Today I'm going to be ranking the Big Brother 22 slash All-Stars 2 cast based on their gameplay and place them into gameplayer tier rankings, where I have the 7 tiers that I've used in all of my videos, so abysmal, bad, potential, mediocre, solid, good, and great, and I'm going to rank them based on how I feel like their strategy and their skills in this season would take place on other seasons, so based on how repeatable it is, and how the strategy worked on this season. And also because this is an all returnee season and they've all played before, I kind of had to consider their prior seasons into consideration a little bit to see if they either improved from their original seasons to this season, if they declined, and all that jazz. So that is my starting point, and I really wanted to get this season and this modern era over with, so let's just get right to it. So at dead last, which is 16th, is Nicole A. For someone who was on the most recent season before this, especially after the latter, she either had two routes, do really well or do really poorly, and unfortunately she was the latter. Apparently she did not do any pre-gaming, which is a huge no-no in a returnee season, especially in an all-star cast, and already came in with very little connections. She also had some tension with the other Nicole and Danielle because of them rejecting her podcast, and she was immediately on the outs in the season. The few people that she did so much bond with were on the outs, like David and Kevin, and to a lesser extent, Kesa and Janelle, but this was the same situation she was in during the last season. But, unfortunately for her, the dynamics in this season did not change and give her room to find a comfortable position in the house. Apparently, she was a potential replacement nominee in the first week, and then she was nominated in the second week due to being an easy choice, and the house just did not gel with her, so she was an easy person to boot. And it did not help that she completely melted down when she was on the block, as she didn't have enough time to recover from it. She talked about going with her gut, since she didn't do that much last season, but her gut was HORRIBLE this season. Nicole decided to not play in the safety suite competition when she absolutely needed to play in it, and then she thought that campaigning against Kaser and Janelle was her way of staying, as she lets people put the bug in her ear. It also did not help that she was stuck with Kevin the entire time, and he had HORRIBLE reads, so it just made her HORRIBLE reads even worse. There really isn't anything positive about her game, and a lot of her active choices were why she was in this position, where there wasn't much of a chance for her making it far into the season. So at 15th is Kaser. He is someone that I could see myself convincing myself to have him either as dead last or lower than when I have him as I am typing this. Recording me now, I initially had him at 14th when I wrote this, but as I'm recording this, I literally just switched him to 15th, so that's kind of what ended up happening. So I was really excited to see how Kaser would adapt in this season, since he essentially skipped two eras of BB, as he wasn't in the post-classic era and came in at literally the tail end of the modern era, which is 14 years. With that point in time and age, I wanted to see if he could improve his flaws that were notable in his two seasons, but he quadrupled down on his flaws from the prior seasons. Kaser came in making his enemies pretty known to everyone which was Cody mainly, and he isn't someone that you automatically gun for unless you have the numbers, and he was already the HOH. Tyler, who actually wanted to work with him at first, and David, who he grouped in with them and the majority alliance, which was an awful read. He created an us versus them alliance when everyone was keeping it calm at first, and actively discouraged Janelle whenever she did have a good read, when she was thinking about making nice with some people and reaching out to certain people. Kaser has the tendency to talk at people instead of, of talking to and listening to people, which rub people the wrong way. Like Bailey, though she does the same thing, and even Janelle got annoyed with him sometimes. He didn't speak game to a lot of the people in the house, and he has the us versus them mentality, and I'm pretty sure that if he did not win the safety suite twist in the first week, he would have been the first boot of the season. Though I give him props for playing in it, following his instinct of being in danger, and winning it. And unlike others who kind of has the us versus them mentality, he isn't settled with it at all and always shows his cards, while others kind of play that part of them down, making everyone feel like they're a part of the us that 
the person is talking about. But Caesar didn't do that. So, he didn't have a huge reputation like Janelle did, where it overshadowed everything, so it makes his bad gameplay even worse. And after she left... He could have laid low and adapted, but he was still stuck on the same path and strategy that didn't work for him the first time or the second time. And he couldn't even win a competition this season, in the form of an HOH or a veto this season, unlike his prior two seasons, though he was close in his final HOH. Kaysar is just unadaptable, not socially inept, and is just a bad player, where another major issue of him is that he has no subtlety in anything, which is just so disappointing. At 14th is... Keisha. A part of me really wanted to put her higher on the list, since there was a factor of her being unlucky in the house this season, which I am going to address right now. She was an alternate and didn't have much time, or any time at all, to be king, and she did not take a more aggressive approach like Memphis did, who was also an alternate who was added in last minute, regarding making alliances, forming those relationships, and really getting into the game. And when you look at the only week she was actively in the house, she was not the initial target, as Cody planned to nominate Kaiser and Janelle, but the safety sweet twist not only caused him to be safe, or them to be safe, but both himself and Janelle were I mean, causing Cody to find new nominations. At the same time, if only one of them were safe, I'm sure Keisha would have been nominated. And if there was a veto replacement with those two on the block, she would have been the replacement nominee anyway, so I don't know how unlucky she really was. Regarding her social game, she didn't have much of a social game. Most of the house did not know who she was, and she didn't give them much for them to get to know her during the week anyways, and she was painfully passive to the point where she was not really playing the game. I don't even really recall her campaigning much at all when she was on the block, and to me it really seemed like and showed that she needed some stronger personalities and more game-savvy people to work with her, like in Big Brother 10, in order for her to do well. Even outside of the unluckiness, I don't see her doing well, and her being so out of the Big Brother community, from not watching the show or being in the alumni circles, to me is another indicator as to why she just couldn't adapt in this season. So, the final person in this tier at 13th is David. For some reason, people felt like he was going to be a good player entering the season and felt like it warranted a spot for him on the season. Despite having a year in between seasons and seemingly getting the call for this season quite a bit before the season actually started, David did absolutely no research. You would think for a show that you barely got to experience yourself and you get a costing that you have a second chance, you would at least watch a season to see how the show formulates or look up some of the popular names that were floating around the casting rumors. He did none of that and entered the season with absolutely no information. He did not know many of the basics that are associated with Big Brother, and he had to consistently be coached by the entire cast. There's a lot of resentment from the cast because they felt like he didn't deserve to be there, and he wasn't picking up on anything because he just didn't really care, and as the season went on, they just found him to be clueless. David did have a pre-game connection to Tyler, which was set up by Ovi, and even that became tense at times, since David was too loose lipped with his information, causing Tyler to distance himself at times. David was not in the majority alliance at all, though people like Cody, Enzo, and especially Tyler tried having him on their side, but they got fed up with him and left him alone as a non-threat at various points in the season. Janelle and Kesa refused to work with him because they thought he was frustrating and irritating, as well as him being aligned with people that he really wasn't. Nicole didn't last long, Nicole A, I mean, and he didn't have much of a relationship with Davon and Bailey, despite them all trying to work together because they're all black. But it was tense because not only was he just very sketchy communicating with them, but they also had a bad impression from him or of him based on what Kimmy told them about him, and even Kevin distrusted him for most of the season. Even when he was telling the truth about situations, and he was telling the truth most of the time, many people thought he was lying, hence why many people thought that he was some of those weird hinking votes that took place, and why he was so easy to set up week 7 for the week 6 vote. David in general couldn't hold water on anything, and the one time he did hide something, like his power, which caused him to veto himself off the block, he lied, him, he lied about it for no reason when everyone knew that he took himself off since no one else cared enough to save him. 
While he was one vote away from staying in his eviction round, it really had nothing to do with him or anything he did, but Christmas and Tyler trying to make a big move, and the fact that most of the house plans to take him a round or two further, but Memphis was obsessed with targeting him and didn't find him worth saving is kind of a bad sign as well. David was poor in competitions, he was poor strategically, and he was pretty poor socially, and was in a completely different universe from everyone else. He made it further than many other people who was higher on this ranking tier list, but completely ruined every chance he could to benefit his game, which was not good, and he was never in an actively good position, and I don't think he has the ability to play the game, even on a basic level. So here he is. So the first person in this tier at 12th is Janelle. A part of me wanted to put her higher, and another part of me wanted to put her lower. One of the factors that I had to consider is that she's definitely the biggest BB name out of everyone in this cast, so people were automatically threatened by her and wanted to take her out so they can be their new quote-unquote BB queen, or some stupid crap like that. People claim that the pre-gaming put her at a huge disadvantage, but the issue with that is that not only was Jenna pre-gaming herself, but she also had some help, allegedly, from Brittany. The main issue is that her pre-gaming didn't work out for her. And a part of me wanted to put her lower because Janelle came in like a ball in a china shop with how she dealt with social relationships. She never even attempted to have a relationship with Nicole, or faked it, where the entire house knew that she was getting for Nicole, who had the numbers, and alienated people like Kevin and David, who could have been numbers that herself and Kaysar needed, by campaigning for Keisha and Nicole so heavily, and didn't realize that people like Devon had other relationships with people that caused her to not prioritize herself or Kaysar. She was close enough to winning HOH in her final week, but the competitions were not her strongest suit in the season, and I do think Kaser being on the season hurt her a lot. Whenever she would have a good idea to make amends with people like Tyler and Cody, he always shut it down and she stuck focusing on the bad reads due to him just being in her ear, and also just not knowing how to properly understand the dynamics of the house. I don't think she really realized that Danielle was against her, and there was no room for her to do anything. I think she would have done better if she was on her own in the season, but her lack of social grace really bit her in the butt, and her ego caused her to be booted very early. I felt like there were more things out of her control in BB14 compared to this season, hence the different tier placement of her two short runs. So at 11th is Kevin. I might move him up a spot since I'm going back and forth between him and a few other people, but here he is right now. I don't recall Kevin doing much of any pre-gaming since he clearly didn't know anyone entering the season, and he was in a completely different era from most of the people on this cast, and I don't think he is huge in the alumni community. That put him at an immediate disadvantage, but he would not have been nominated in the first week had Kaysar and Janelle not gotten safety. But it became clear almost immediately that in the season, Kevin was just very off emotionally and seemed mentally and even spiritually fragile, where he broke down so much whenever he was nominated, could not find himself to bond with a majority of the other huskies, especially the men who are the muscular, attractive type, so I think he had some baggage from his past regarding those types of people that he let affect him in the season. In addition to that, he had several poor reads throughout the season, as he encouraged Nicole a spiral and bounced off with Devon and even Bailey's horrible reads throughout the season. Kevin was nominated several times throughout the season because he was seen as expendable to everyone in the house, and while they tried to assure him that he was a likable pun, that didn't matter once most of the quote-unquote other side was gone, and he was never able to gain traction in the season. Whenever he tried to align with some people, they were always either on the way out of the house, which we saw with Nicole A, and then getting closer to Bailey, Devon, and David when all their times in the house were coming to an end. And I don't even recall him having any ties to the community alliance whatsoever, not even as a subsidiary. The house really had no respect for him as a player, so it made his winning chances even lower, and I do think this was closer to how his game in BB11 would have been like had the coup not changed the direction of the game, since he was on the outs as well in that season. But unlike that season, he didn't have someone like Achima or even Anali to keep him up on the actual dynamics in the house. He did win a veto, so I will give him that, but he was not a consistent performer during most of the competitions, so he doesn't have that going for him. 
His relationship with Cody really ended on a bad note, and the committee didn't even bother using him as a number one, or a plus one, my bad, or tried to build a relationship with him to be such because they didn't respect him enough and he was really handicapped though a lot of it was of his own doing. He was just not there emotionally and was very insecure, where he let that control his game, hence not getting over Janelle and Keisha campaigning for Keisha to stay when he was on the block, when they all needed one another. It was just a really poor showing, and it shows to me that he isn't adaptable and thinks outside of his control has to happen for him to be in a good position. At 10th, I have Davon. So I'm shocked that she isn't slower, though she's still in the bad tier and played horribly this season, especially since she had many benefits entering the season. She was in a newer season, so people definitely recognized her. She could have used her potty connection to get close to Cody. She could have used her Josh connection to get close to Christmas. She actually knew the older players since she watched those seasons. She partook in the challenge, which is a harder show competition-wise and held her own there, and she didn't have a big target or much of a target entering the season since she isn't a good player. One thing about her that I will give her props for is that she always manages to find herself in a majority alliance, or a solid alliance at least, whenever a season starts, and we see this in all three of her seasons, where a lot of people don't even have that going for them. The Slick Six Alliance was a thing that everyone in the Alliance took seriously, at least to some extent, and while that might have been a side alliance for some, it still caused her to not be nominated during those first few weeks, and we have seen many side alliances become real alliances in a season. The issue is, and it's been the issue on all of her seasons, is that Devon is too distrusting. She would be given information by Cody, Tyler, or Enzo for an example, and she would tell them that she had to fact check instead of just taking their word for it. This showed that not only does she not trust him, but she would blow stuff up by asking stuff to people that she shouldn't be asking them to, or the people who told her the information didn't want her to relay back to them. This caused a lot of distrust with people, and while she did this in BB-18, which made it worse here is that she did not have the social connections, as a lot of the house guests were not close to her, did not want to be aligned with her, and the few connections she did have, she ruined, like with David, due to what Kimmy and Twitter said, and she blew off Janelle and Kaser when she did need to take what they were saying and take it in. When it comes to competitions, she did win a competition for the first time in her BB career with the veto, which is something that she couldn't accomplish beforehand, and she was close to winning in Age of Age, but of course her not winning in Age of Age really hindered her, since the Sixth Alliance would have been more solidified, which would have put her in a better position throughout the season. They won't let herself get tricked by Nicole again, and a Califriori brother again, and she spiraled because she incorrectly proclaimed that David flipped on the vote when he was the one who wanted it to be a tie vote to begin with. She didn't know what was happening and then idiotically told a mostly white cast that she can't vote people out due to them being black, where nothing good was going to come out of that. While she did win a veto, I do think this is arguably her worst game as whatever positive she had beforehand, mainly her perceptiveness, evaporated here in this season. So at 9th, I have Ian. He was initially number 8, but I made a last minute switch around. Even though he had the weirdest circumstances for his eviction, unlike everyone else that was not in the majority alliance, but I couldn't put him in a higher tier, since I don't think he had potential based on what he displayed in this season. Being one of the two winners of the season, or on the season, Ian knew that there was definitely going to be some sort of target on him, and he correctly realized that he needed to lay low in the first half of the season, which worked for him. While the strategy was ideal for him, I also think it's very similar to what he did in BB14, so it wasn't anything new, and it worked out there, but not here. The thing with being under the radar is that there's a difference in playing a low-key game, and then being a complete non-factor in the dynamics of the house, where you're almost damn near on an island, and Ian was the latter. From what I remembered, he only got close to winning a few competitions in the season, so he couldn't even comp beast the second half of the game like he expected to, and the issue is that in this season, there are a lot stronger competitors in this season compared to his last, where it was mainly just Frank and Shane, and he was working with both to some extent. And the competitions became more physical from BB14 to BB22. 
so he was at a disadvantage. Socially, while he did have a connection to Nicole due to them being winners and agreeing to work with people like Cody and Danielle, though it was a complete fake alliance on their end, he didn't have a solid connection with many other people. He saw people like Devon, Bailey, Kevin, and David as lessers, though he absolutely needed to start working with some of them, or even having a fake alliance with them would have benefited him, had nothing notable with Janelle, Kesar, or Nicole A, and Danielle and Cody kept him at an arm's distance, despite having a phone alliance with him. Many said that he barely spoke much to them at all, not even just about not talking game with them, but about anything at all. There was some unluckiness with how he went home, since one of the nominees had a power to save himself, and the other nominee was beat up by someone else to be on the block. This meant that he was the fourth nominee, and most people don't get to nominate four people on an HOA train, so he would have been safe in that week and round under normal circumstances. At the same time, even if he didn't go that round, he would have been taken out in the next few weeks anyways, with nothing changing about his game. I think this season showed that more often than not, Ian will be on the out of a power alliance, not having much of an idea of what's going on in the house, where the little bit that he was told about, he had to be guaranteed to it by a wall yeller, and would be an easy, expendable person to boot. If anything, it shows a lot more of the holes in his BB14 game, as he kind of did the same thing here, but in a different dynamic and cast, and he didn't get the exact results that he was expecting. And the final person in this tier at 8th is Bailey. I initially had her at 9th, but I switched her with Ian Wright as I started recording this. So here she is right now. She was able to connect with Devon, particularly through Swaggy's request, and them being the only black woman on the cast, and she might have known Polly before the season due to some comments he made, so she could have connected with Cody about that as well. Obviously, she knew Tyler, though it was a bad relationship, but she was in a decent enough position, since it did seem like she became a bit, and she didn't have the reputation of being a threat or having much of a target, so she could easily go under the radar. Bailey was actually doing well at first, since a lot of the house actually liked her, as she was supposed to be a part of the committee alliance, which ended up running the season. But Danielle shut it down due to her connection with Devon, which is very problematic. She was a part of the Slick Six, and while it was the backup alliance, it could have been real by the result of an HOH win, and Taylor and Enzo did keep her safe. Her main issue, which was even present in BB20, is that she is way too trusting. And I think that's the difference between her and Devon, where Devon is too distrusting, Bailey is too trusting, and feels like her friendships with people should be enough even when they're not particularly aligned. Or she feels like because she likes someone so deeply, she feels like they think the same way. So she kind of overestimates her relationships with people, which we saw on both BB seasons and even in Total Madness, actually, of the challenge. It caused her to completely ignore Kesar's warning, where it applied to her even more than it did Devon, as she didn't want to work with him, despite having Janelle in common, while her own alliance was plotting for her to be a pre jar When things got tough, Bailey had a huge meltdown, and couldn't focus on the game whatsoever, which is another repeated pattern for her, where she just shut down. I don't recall her actually being good in any competition in the season, and she was extremely complacent when it comes to the strategy. In Big Brother 20, she was at least the leader of her alliance when Swaggy left, but here she didn't even try to lead, she was mainly just a huge follower, and it didn't even pan out for her. And the final straw for her is that she was bragging about being a better juror to many of the house guests, which was the real reason why she was sent home pre-jury. In general, while she was calmer in the season, and I do think she tried to improve, her flaws came back this time around, and she wasn't as well positioned as she was in her prior season. So, no one fits the potential tier, so I'm just going to move on. So, at 7th, I have Danielle. A part of me really wants to put her in the bad tier, and I said that tier and not in the potential tier, since I don't think there's any untapped potential with her, or that she was robbed in any way. But the bad tier is too large, and she is a bit better than that tier, though I could easily be tucked into putting her there. Despite coming from an older season, she was able to not get frozen out of the cast when it comes to the pre-game, and actually making allegiances with people in the house. But I do think that a lot of it has to do with her real-life friendship with Nicole. She was approached to be in the committee alliance, which had Christmas, Cody, Nicole, Tyler, and Memphis, 
while she was also a part of the Slick Six Alliance, which also included Dave Wan and Bailey, so she was in a good position, in addition to Janelle wanting to work with her. All of this is good, and Danielle could have coasted as long as she maintained her social and strategic relationships well, but Danielle is Danielle, and she did the same thing she did in Big Brother 13. What I mean by that is that she spread a lot of unnecessary paranoia throughout the house, whether it is her allies or her non-allies, and she thought that she was planting seeds against others. But it was only planting seeds against herself, because people caught on very quickly on what she was doing. This caused her to be at the bottom of her alliance by the time of the second week, and even some people that were not aligned with her got annoyed with her. Luckily for Danielle, her alliance kept her from going home, as they kept on winning HOHs, so they didn't target her, but there were many times where her allies wanted to target her. But the wrong person from the alliance won HOH, like Christmas winning HOH after Tyler plotted to boot her with Enzo the prior week, and Memphis winning in the triple when the house wanted her gone. I realized that in all of her seasons, she was very reliant on either herself or her allies winning HOHs, so that's kind of a negative for her. Danielle kept on targeting people that she needed to stay in the house to go after the people in her own alliance who didn't prioritize her, but didn't realize her position until Davon was headed out the door, and it was too late, as the entire house specifically did that so they could screw her over. She had her H to H, which she could have used to position herself while in the game, especially as the jury position started, and she already nominated Tyler, where there were other people that she could have nominated, but chickened out of evicting him, only solidifying herself on the bottom of the house, and then wanting Nicole's votes to be kept a secret to make her lose trust with even most more people. Danielle did not perform well in competitions compared to her prior seasons, so that wasn't even a strong computer contributor for her. And I felt like Danielle was more delusional about her position in the game here, even compared to her prior seasons where she seemed more aware. Socially, Danielle was pretty rough since most of her allies either never liked her or started disliking her as the weeks went on and she was completely snowed about it. And she, strategically, she had a lot of decent ideas but she never sat on them and she cannot lay low to save her life. She thought that the issue with her last season was that she turned too early, which was only a part of the issue. The main thing she needed to fix was to not be a blatant pot stirrer, and she didn't do that, but she had enough positives to escape the bad tear. So the first person at this tier, at 6, which might actually be controversial, is Christmas. So, I found her to be a pretty interesting one to me, as there are elements of her game this season that is the exact same as her BB-19 game, and there are elements of her game this season that is different, in a positive way. I believe she and Tyler had a pre-game alliance, because he was friends with Casey, she was friends with Josh, and the two of them are from the challenge, and were supposed to be on this season, so she and Tyler became their final twos, and she ended up in the committee alliance. She also had a final two with Memphis, and got very close to Enzo, who was a subsidiary of that alliance, which is all good, and she got along well with Nicole and Danielle at first. We saw her do the same thing she did in BB-19, where she put in everything to the alliance that she is in, and played for the team, which makes her a good ally, but it causes her to miss certain details that she needs to pay attention to. Her social game did seem good during the first few weeks, even with the people who were not in her alliance, but things went downhill for her when she won HOH. Her nominating Bailey and Devon was not a bad thing for her game, though Bailey thought that their friendship should be enough, despite them not being aligned, but how she handled it, in addition to arguing with them and trying to make herself a victim, was a really bad look, and a respect factor in the house declined after that. And while she had relations and alliances with many people in the house, she didn't have anything regarding to the end game with the man running the house in Cody. What this meant was that she was close to the bottom of her alliance, and the only person outside of her alliance she tried to build something with is David, and didn't align with Danielle when both were on the low end of the alliance. She did realize that a shot needed to be taken against Nicole and Cody, which is something that even Danielle realized, and I do appreciate the move in the triple, but it was a bit too late, and while she made up with Nicole, she was on the block for the last three weeks she was in the house, and didn't really stay during those two votes due to anything she did. 
Christmas is someone who I don't think will ever be an early boot, as she isn't a chaotic player that will bring attention or drama to herself in the beginning, and she's a huge team player, so it makes her one of the best choices for an ally, especially since she isn't the most self-interested person ever. At the same time, I do think that her personality does rub people the wrong way at times, and it causes people to lose respect for her in general, so she has a hard time winning, especially as the season goes on. I do think she became more self-interested here compared to last season, but she doesn't take advantage of her social skills and making allies with a bunch of people, and making connections outside of her group, and she's generally pretty passive, though she did want to make moves later on, when she was on the outs. She's in between solid and mediocre overall, hence her being here. And the final person in this tier at 5th is Tyler. What a frustrating experience watching Tyler's journey throughout the season in general. It was clear that he expected Casey and Josh to be in the house with him so he could have his four-person pregame aligned with them and Christmas, and them being pulled last minute caught him off guard. Now this stopped him from being included in the Sixth Sense and the Committee Alliances, and he was one of the few who were somewhat interested in working with some of the older players, so Tyler was pretty set in those early weeks, despite Kesar trying to target him. Once it was clear that Kesar would not work with him at all, he targeted the Season 6 pair, was able to make up with Bailey, and got close to a lot of the guys, even playing up the bro-centricness that his allies were giving off. Like in Big Brother 20, he was set up very well in the pre-jury and was seen as one of the front runners, as he had great strategic insight, was doing very well socially, and was still winning competitions. But he fell off and not only took his foot off the gas, but tried to blatantly quit the game at the end of the pre-jury portion because he missed Angela so much and he didn't fall in love with Big Brother again. There were a bunch of people in the game with spouses, children, careers, etc. that didn't quit, and obviously they caused a lot of people to lose respect for him. And what made it even worse is that he tried to martyr himself by bringing up the Black Lives Matter movement as he was doing this to quote unquote spare Bailey and Devon. Of course he was not allowed to quit, and how he handled the aftermath was awful as he really didn't clear things up with them and, didn't, and actively avoided speaking to them until the ceremony happened. Tyler did get himself in the game and was almost sent home the next week, but it really wasn't due to anything he did, but because Cody and the Alliance deliberately wanted to ruin Danielle's game. After that, Tyler became way too obsessed and Lisa focused with getting Danielle out of the game without realizing that he wasn't at the top of his Alliance and many of them mentioned that he didn't really speak to them much, so his relationship started weakening as well. What we saw in Big Brother 20 pertaining burnout, which happened in the last quarter of that season, happened here, but it happened a lot earlier in this season, and he really broke down, and started neglecting a lot of relationships. This to me shows that he cannot stay focused long enough to win a season without dealing. And I also forgot to mention that he only brought up the committee alliance to Enzo when he was on his way out, where if he told him earlier, like Cody did, he potentially could have gained Enzo's trust earlier. He's still good in competitions, was pretty solid strategically, as he almost took the reins from Cody before his meltdown, and is pretty good socially, so he does have the skills to be a top tier Big Brother player. I also think he was worried about his reputation for being a snake, being cunning, and being seen as a bad person, and let that affect him. I also think he was too caught up in his brand, which also influenced how he played the game in general. So all of that definitely encompassed him. And it's said that he is two tiers lower here than he was in Big Brother 20. So it'll be interesting to see where he loves out once I rank him at the end of this era. So at fourth and the first person in this tier, I have Enzo. Some might have him higher, and I think I could maybe be talked into it, but from what I saw of him this season, Enzo being on the spot and tier is fitting. I don't know how much pre-gaming he really did before the season, but he really didn't need to pre-game, since he immediately bonded with Cody, due to them being Italians from New Jersey, and both are very bro-centric guys who stuck with their alliances for an entire season to steamroll. Despite not technically being a part of the committee, he was essentially a subsidiary of that alliance, like Polly in BB-18, JC in BB-20, and somewhat Sam in BB-21, while also being a part of the Slick 6 alliance. He was in a very good position throughout the season, and took the safe route when he won HOH by targeting Kaser, who he had no relationship with whatsoever. 
He did improve in competitions, which was one of his weaknesses in general throughout BB12, as he won quite a bit in the beginning, and his allies realized that he isn't a liability this season. So many people wanted to work with him and felt very safe with him throughout the season, but he would run everything by Antsu Cody, which would squash anything the others are trying to build, though Tyler was the main one who was close to pulling Enzo away. He didn't do anything of note in the mid-game, outside of wanting to get rid of most of the women, and that came off as pretty misogynistic, not even gonna lie, and tightened his relationships with Memphis and Christmas. There was the triple eviction, where Tyler and Christmas wanted him to vote out Nicole, and he decided not to because he didn't want to vote against Cody. This would have given him a lot more agency in the game for himself, especially since it wasn't like he had anything with Nicole at this point. Everything after that was essentially him doing whatever Cody wanted him to do, and whatever individual idea he had was quickly shot down by Cody. I think he is solid enough competitively, especially compared to BB12, it's really good socially, and is solid enough strategically, though his strategy is kind of baseline, but he doesn't use his social capital to the best he can, and he only used it to not get nominated, instead of really influencing the house in the most advantageous way for him. I can say the same about his strategy, since he talked about others needing to make moves, but he never did such when he had the opportunity. Overall, I just don't think he has the killer instinct that a winner and a top tier player needs, though I see him being an end gamer most times that he plays, but I don't really know if he really improved based on this BB12 game, and might have just stayed pretty much the same, which is why I have him here. So, at third, I have Memphis. I am back and forth on him, and the person that I have at number two, but I have him here for now, since I do think he was a bit more flawed overall. I don't know how far the alleged pre-gaming he and Dan really did that took place, since he was initially an alternate in this season, but I do think he took advantage of the opportunity presented to him, since he was the first one who aggressively formed a big alliance in the season, which is the committee where everyone else was playing pretty passively in the first week. And the alliance, which easily could have been a side alliance, was solidified once he won H O H. and I do like how self-interested he was with his H O H, as he refused to nominate Janelle and Kesar, since they were not going after him, and it gives him another week, as others will target them instead. Though it starts the pattern of him not really communicating with his allies about his nominations, but he did win an H O H in BB10, and ended up winning 3 here. The thing with his HOHs is that he was obsessed with targeting David, where there are bigger fish to fry, and I honestly don't even know if it was the best move for him to consistently target David. And he ended up being convinced that other people needed to be sent home. Like, he was convinced to send Davon home on a second HOH. Nicole kind of had the house flipped on her on his first HOH, too. Luckily for him, his alliance members kept on winning H O H, so there was no reason for him to be in danger, where if people not in his alliance won H O H, there's definitely a chance that he could have been nominated and sent home. And during his H O Hs, he liked making a bunch of deals with people, which is a good sign and it shows that he's out for himself, but the way he does it makes him come off as a used car salesman, which was an issue for him even in BB10, and it affected him socially in that season too. It did kind of work for him throughout the season, as he made many final twos and final threes with people like Enzo, Christmas, Cody, and even made a few full alliances with some others. He wanted the group to stay together, and was one of the more instrumental people in doing that, also hoping that his deals will cause him to make it to the end game. The big critique people had of him in BB10 was that he was a follower of Dan, where he came off as more of a leader here, so I do think he genuinely improved in that element. The big flaw with Memphis is his social game. While I don't think it's awful, as he did have some friends, and wasn't picking fights with everyone, or even most people in general, there were times where he didn't speak to people, and most of his interactions came off as transactional. It got to the point where even his allies commented on it, though he did come off as antagonistic to David, which was just very uncomfortable to watch. It was an issue during BB10, and it was a similar issue in this season, though we did see him get really close to someone, i.e. Christmas, though it didn't involve the game at all. I think Memphis stuck with his procentric strategy, but was a bit more individualistic, and from what has been stated, he did have a chance to win, so with all of that, he is here. 
At number two is Nicole F, and this is the final person in this tier. Not very sure about her being number two, but she's definitely in a different tier from who is at number one. Nicole came in being one of the two winners from a previous season, and it definitely made her a target to some people, especially when the likes of Janelle was very vocal about targeting her from the very beginning. Nicole most likely pre-gamed, had Cody in the house where their mothers are close, and she worked with his brother on her last season, her real-life friend Danielle is in the house, and found herself in the community alliance, which was the dominant alliance in the season. Nicole has the tendency to stick with a majority alliance, position herself in a way where she can't be targeted really, and victimizes herself, which works well for her. She was also able to make amends with Levon to the point where the latter starts working with her and planting the seeds to make sure that Bailey went home over Devon, which was definitely advantageous for her. She was able to build social relationships with people in the alliance, and she was not building a target for herself within the alliance, like Danielle was. She also had a side alliance with Ian, which is a good thing, since they were both winners and it did give her some extra wiggle room, but there's the dilemma in the Arid jury, where he was nominated against Tyler and she decided to stand by him, despite Ian being more likely to protect her over Tyler, who was planning to nominate her against Danielle and would have targeted her after Danielle is booted, all because she wanted to stick by Cody. The thing that became very noticeable to me is that she was kind of playing for Cody's best interest instead of hers, and whatever she did do so she can get to the end with Cody, knowing that he had a good chance of beating her, so the agency wasn't there as much as I would have liked it to be. But it does remind me of BB-18, where she did intend on going to the end with Polly and Cory, and they would have taken each other to the end over her, and other people had to take the shot at Polly, which she had no control over. Even the same thing with Cory, technically, since I do think he beats her at the end, but that's beside the point. What happened this season is essentially what happens if there are no outliers to take a shot at her closest allies, like what happened in BB-18. We did see her make up with Christmas after the triple, which gave her an option as to having more endgame paths for herself, but she didn't particularly fight hard for it. She realized that Cody was keeping all of his options open for himself, but didn't want to do it for her, which should have been a sign to her that he didn't prioritize her as much as Enzo. Nicole was okay at competitions, and I don't think she performed well or as well as she did in her prior seasons. Her social game didn't really change, as she kind of struggles with some people not in her alliance, and she struggles to own her game, which bit her in the butt of the season, where it wasn't a guarantee that she wins if she makes it to the end. It is impressive that Nicole was able to make it to the end again, despite being one of the two winners in the season, and she knew how to position herself, but I don't really see it as an evolution based on her gameplay, and she was playing more for someone else this season, even compared to BB-18. And the obvious first place, and the only person in the great tier, is Cody. It was very clear to me and many others that the season was essentially Cody's to win and lose or lose. From the moment the cast was revealed for a plethora of reasons. Nicole, someone he played with, Devon, who was friends with his brother, Enzo and Memphis, two percentric players, and Danielle, who's friends with Nicole, are all on the cast. He is from a recent enough season where he isn't going to be targeted from being too distant from Big Brother, like Keisha, Kevin, Janelle, and Kaser. He is a good looking white man who knows how to use it to his advantage. He is a level headed player, is easy to work with, while being good at competitions, and not having much of a target on him. With all that in mind, it was just seeing how he would handle the season, and when he won the first H to H, it was clear that it was over for everyone else, essentially. He was brought into two alliances, the Committee Alliance and the Six Alliance, which gave him enough numbers to easily coast to the jury phase of the season, as he just focused on getting Kaser and Jenna out for the first month of the season. He pretty much just maintained his relationships with everyone in the house and booted the people he had no ties or alliances with first. What I didn't really notice about Cody is that he pretty much instilled fear in people where if he is not your main ally or doesn't tell him everything, he will cause the entire house to boot you, so he arranged his boot order based off of that, especially with the people he had ties with. Cody is a pretty good guest writer from what I saw this season, especially with how he shuts 
people down whenever they have a moment of self-interest, even if they aren't going against him, and does it without being aggressive. Cody did have all of his allies win competitions, and he won a bunch as well, where he became arguably the biggest competition beast in history. Because his allies won all of the competitions, essentially, and because he had final twos, threes, and fours with many of them, they all protected him, despite knowing how much of a threat he is. Even if Kickstarter won an early HOH and he nominated Cody, there's really no way that Cody goes home. Cody was able to maintain all of it, and I believe he played the first perfect game, if I remember correctly, where he was never nominated, not even in the final three, due to someone winning the final HOH, and received a unanimous vote to win the season. I really don't hold the pre-gaming against him, since there's been pre-gaming in all returning seasons in Big Brother, and reality TV shows in general, and a lot of that stuff goes out of the window when you're in the house. I do think Cody is someone who's going to do well in any season, since he's relatively level-headed, he uses his good looks and his privilege to his advantage, he's good at competitions, and he's good strategically, and unlike BB-16, he was a lot more selfish and self-interested in this season, so I do think that he improved in that element, and I will give him that props. While I don't think he played an interesting game, what he plays with, or how he plays, works for him. And the one thing that I do question is how he would act if there's any sort of opposition, since whenever something didn't go slightly his way, you did start to see him panic, and I could see a scenario where if things didn't go his way, or if someone was actively targeting him and won H to H to target him, he might act like his brother Polly, or pretty close to it, so that's probably going to be the one thing that holds me back from putting him at the highest of highest, since I don't know how he would do if he was playing at the bottom. So that is my gameplay tier ranking for Big Brother 22 and the cast. To be honest, I don't think many people really improve on their reputations based on how they played the game or improved their gameplay potential. I think a lot of people either stayed the same or decreased in general, hence so many people being in the bad or the abysmal tier, to be honest. So after this, I'm going to rank everyone from the modern era, which is from Big Brother 16 to Big Brother 22, and for the people who returned, they're not going to have separate slots based on the seasons they did. I'll just combine all of them into one slot. So Nicole, despite competing in three seasons, will only have one slot. Same thing with Devon, so on and so forth. So I'm going to rank everyone from that era based on the game player tiers that I've set up. And then after that, I will move on to BB23, BB24, BB25, maybe make a tier ranking for that era as we know it so far. And then I, at some point, will rank everyone from Big Brother USA history, though by the time I get through the last three seasons, I will probably post the tier rankings of how I rank everyone from BB Cant, because I'm pretty sure by the time I finish 25, BB Cant 12 will be airing, or close to airing, so that's pretty much all. Thank you all for following me on this journey, you can follow me on my social media at Lala underscore Annie at Twitter, and I'll definitely be back with more content soon. Take care.